even as a techie, I, I should be one who says, hey, let's just go for the data and the data is everything. Let's just judge everybody by their data. But then you start applying AI to it and suddenly uh, the machine starts reasoning about things that it should not be reasoning about. So bringing in race, sex, religion, uh, political affiliations. And once that data is in there, and once they're trying to figure out whether you're a good candidate for a loan or for uh, insurance or for whatever, if it start factoring in uh, uh, things that are prohibited by law, we've got an unlawful system behaving in a very unaccountable way. We're obviously a privacy organization. We've been around for over 20 years. Um, at the moment, we have three broad programs of work. Uh, the first one would be in government surveillance, uh, particularly around some of the, the UK government surveillance and the Snowden documents from the various different Five Eyes countries. We also have a very large uh, program where we work with between about 20 and 22 partners around the world, so from uh, South America, Africa, Asia, um, where we coordinate and try and uh, transfer the expertise that they have in, in their regions to various different other regions. And in some cases, it's putting privacy on the map, and in others, uh, the partners are, are so up to speed on the issue that they're really hitting and doing some really good work. And then the final area is the area that I'm responsible for, which we call data exploitation, which is about the um, excessive data that has been generated by us and our devices on our behalf. And then the artificial intelligence and machine learning that goes into converting that into a model about you to make decisions or predictions at, that will influence your life. Since Snowden, and maybe even possibly before that, uh, companies may have felt that they were getting a rough deal and a rough ride, but I think the pressure was taken off them when Snowden came. A different sort of pressure came on in terms of their cooperation with governments, but that still doesn't address the issue of the amount of excessive data that they're collecting on us, the processing that they're doing, the data, who they're sharing the data with, where it's going and what the consequences are for us. So I think the corporate side of things needs to, and, and I think is from a privacy international perspective, becoming more in focus and becoming more of a priority than the Snowden government stuff. They'll always be the same because we always have to fight the two battles of state and companies who can potentially uh, uh, be problematic. But not to say that all companies are problematic. There are some who try to do, for example, end-to-end -end encryption where a, a company will say, look, we don't want to know your, the content of your text messages. And, you know, not only do we not want to know, we're going to provably not have mathematical access to it, but then the governments come along and say, well, that's not what we want, so can you please remove that? Which is what we're seeing now in the UK. We see time and time again where tragedies um, that happen around the world um, are used opportunistically by governments to try and push forward um, increased levels of surveillance and um, ultimately control over the citizenry uh, under the guise of this evil. And the amount of money that they spend is not necessarily commensurate or proportionate to, for example, healthcare, where there are so many people not getting the healthcare and dying, and a disproportionate level of, of, of emphasis seems to be placed on. on the notion of terrorism and I think with the San Bernardino case, particularly with Apple, they probably saw it as a very good opportunity to tug in the heartstrings of America and on the judges and to create a precedent, which is bad. The fact that e e even though Apple is fighting, uh, that if this was done behind closed doors, which we would have been done in the UK, um, it's bad that we are all even resigned that if the US government want, wants into our information, they will get in. One of the biggest problems in having done tech and law, uh, lawyers, lawyers find it very, very difficult to get their head around uh, privacy and surveillance law because it is at the very edge of both rule of law, democracy, and what the courts can do. And interestingly enough, having worked in some law firms, um, any guarantees that a lawyer will give a client is about confidentiality 
only as good as their techie because their techie can read pretty much every email that comes into that partner. Is that confidentiality? I'm not sure. I don't think it's necessarily a challenge worth winning because we've so many different fronts to fight it on. Uh, there's the technological front, there's the policy front, and there's the legal front. And in a weird way, if we don't win it, we're kind of screwed because if they know what we're going to do, they can test out our response to uh, political theories, political policies that they roll out, and we can, they can basically just market test us now as to what was popular, what was not popular, and how can they massage it in such a way so they remain in power, but yet still get the, 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 uh, the things they want to see for their interested parties behind them. The IMSI catcher device is, is relatively unique because if the police wanted to get the data coming from your phone, they could go to the mobile phone companies. So if they're behaving the way they ought to behave and go through the regular checks and balances where you've got companies, they'll, have, they'll receive a warrant and then they'll check it and do all this sort of stuff. It's almost as if the police have said, mm, well, right, we have that opportunity to do that, but we're gonna do it ourselves, which means nobody's really holding us to account when we do it ourselves. And that's one of the most nefarious uses of IMSI catchers is because they're done independent of a legal system, but it's also a way of your metadata betraying you and your phone betraying you where you could go to protest, we could go to protest A together, It'd be different parts of the, of, of the protest, you might go to protest B and then I might go to protest C. They have all the unique identifiers of our phones and they can look at them and go, well who are the people we're really interested in? There's this core group of 20 people who intended all three protests maybe you need to touch them closer, which they wouldn't have had otherwise. And arguably, do they even have a right to know that there are 10 people attending all three protests? Surveillance is, is, has now become uh, an invisible hand of control um, that is unaccountable for the most part. And uh, you can have not gotten a job before you even sit down for an interview. You can have not gotten a loan before you even step foot in the bank. Um, your credit rating will say more about you than anything you can put down on the form. We, we are no longer trusted as people. It's what independent sources of information that have collected say about us is what's more trusted than we are. Um, I don't like that. Um, even as a techie, I, I should be one who says, hey, let's just go for the data and the data is everything. Let's just judge everybody by their data. But then you start applying AI to it and suddenly uh, the machine starts reasoning about things that it should not be reasoning about. So bringing in race, sex, religion, uh, political affiliations. And once that data is in there, and once they're trying to figure out whether you're a good candidate for a loan or for uh, insurance or for whatever, if it start factoring in uh, uh, things that are prohibited by law, we've got an unlawful system behaving in a very unaccountable way the political ramifications for having people spied on may not necessarily uh, create the kind of shift that we would hope but it certainly starts something and the more we get the more we can continue almost like a snowball just like with Edward Snowden the first one came out everybody said something thought it would go away next one comes out it's like oh well we're gonna have to deal with this a little bit third one comes out more and more and more and the more you, more momentum you can get behind these things the more change you're likely to create. It's not never guaranteed that you're going to create it, but you can just create the best conditions. We need more people being engaged in this political debates. Lots of people say, oh, I was demonstrating in the past, nothing changed. Democracy means that we have to keep on, that we have to get engaged all the time.